So welcome all to the second of Feminist Dissent's Biden Seminar, entitled Everyday Borders, Gender, Race and Migration in an International Perspective. As some of you may know, Feminist Dissent is an online journal based at the University of Warwick. It brings together an editorial collective, a dynamic group of activists, academics, and artists, and its issues, and we had about four now, are devoted to examining the multiple links between gender, fundamentalism, and authoritarianism of all strikes, and to promoting new thinking on secularism, multiculturalism, social justice, and feminist resistance. Please do look us up on our website, and of course, we also welcome contributions of essays, interviews, and art. For today's webinar, I just want to thank a few people. First of all, uh, we want to thank Warwick's IAPL, Institute for Advanced Teaching and Learning, for providing Roxanne Bibizade, who's Feminist Descent's editorial assistant, and me with a fellowship to design and imagine a module inspired by the themes of feminist descent that would model what we think feminist pedagogy should be all about, which is interactive and public in the best senses of the word. So while we have participants here at Warwick, those of you who are physically here in the classroom, we're also welcoming participants who have logged on from different parts of the world. And we want this to be a part of the module that we teach, which is that we are addressing students here at Warwick, but we're also bringing in people from across the world. We especially welcome those who typically may not have access to university education or to, to modules. They may be working or activists and, and so on. So that's the idea. Uh, and in particular, we wish to thank Roger from Warwick's IT services who has worked tirelessly to assist us with this technology. And it's quite a challenging thing because you're trying to connect so many different people that we are still testing and developing. But we hope that once the module is actually up and running, we would have smoothed out uh, these difficulties. So uh, we're absolutely honored and delighted to have today's seminar uh, on everyday borders led by Mira Yuval Davis, who is Professor Emeritus and Honorary Director of the Research Center on Migration, Refugees and Belonging at the University of East London. She has been a founder member of Women Against Fundamentalism and the International Research Network on Women in Militarized Conflict Zones, and has acted as a consultant for various United Nations and human rights organizations. She won the 2018 International Sociological Association Distinguished Award for Excellence in Research and Practice. She has written widely on intersected gender nationalism racism, fundamentalism, citizenship, identity, belonging, and everyday bordering, as well as on situated intersectionality and dialogical epistemology. A co-authored essay from 2018, Everyday Bordering, Belonging, and the Reorientation of British Immigration Legislation, published in the journal Sociology, has just won the Sage Sociology Prize for Best Article. Her book on the same topic is being launched on the 22nd of May at SOAS. So it is with great pleasure and enthusiasm that I want to welcome Neera to this seminar. Our format will be that Neera will talk first, uh, and then she, will, she wants to show us a, a few clips from a film that she will involved in making called Everyday Borders that emerged from her research on this topic. And after that, we will open up the session
for questions and discussion, both from here within the classroom as well as invite uh, guests who have logged on. I can see there are about 16 people already logged on. Uh, and if they have any questions um, for me or for the general discussion. So thank you for bearing with us, Neera, and welcome. I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Rashmi. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I'm really um, sorry that you can't see me. At least I can see some of you. And Rashmi forgot to mention one thing, which is that I'm also a member of Feminist Descent. And of course, um, this is, uh, I mean, Rashmi and I have been together at Women Against Fundamentalism, but also uh, I'm very proud to be with her in the editorial collective of this online, uh, globally freely accessible journal, Feminist Descent. Uh, as Rashmi said, today I'm going to talk about our work. It's not on borders, it's on bordering the process. And in a way, already the mere act of my giving you a lecture is part of everyday bordering because actually I'm now committing an illegal act. I received this morning an email from the University of Warwick, which told me that it would be illegal for me to give a lecture before I have an interview at the University of Warwick and send them all kinds of documents. Because although I've been a British citizen since the 60s and teaching in British universities since the 70s, I am suspected to be an illegal migrant and have to prove that I am a, uh, I'm not uh, one. So what has been happening under what we call every bo everyday bordering in Britain is that everyone, not just migrants, but everyone, including those who have been born in Britain for many generations, is on the one hand suspected of being illegal migrants and, and until they prove that it's the other way, they are, cannot work legally, even if it's a one-off, like giving this lecture or examining a PhD dissertation. And on the other hand, all citizens are required to become unpaid and untrained border guards. Because the woman who sent me this email from the University of Warwick, she's not from the Home Office, she is not a border guard. And um, usually it's us in the academia as the teachers, we are, which are supposed to check that all the students that we teach are legally are, are legally uh, able to do it, or the, the administra administration has to prove that the workers are all uh, legal. And the 2016 Immigration Act have not only obliged everybody to do this everyday bordering task uh, for them, but also threaten with criminalization of those who fail to do that. There is a situation in which either an employer or a landlord or some a, a hospital or a university who fail to identify that, for example, if they get uh, be, being given a passport, which is um, a, a, a forgery, and they fail to discover that because nobody taught them how to do it, this is a criminal offense. And if this happened more than once, they can very well end up being in prison. Interestingly enough, those who are paid and are trained to be border guards, if they fail to identify people who enter the country or work illegally or work in, uh, illegally, they are not sent to prison, only the citizens are. So what we've been finding out is that borders and 
bordering, and we are talking about bordering as a process which involves deterritorialization and re-territorialization of borders and the proliferation of borders everywhere and to everybody. All this has happened and is replacing the multiculturalism as the main technology of controlling diversity and discourses of diversity. Britain is quite at the front of that, but by no means it is the only one. I've given uh, lectures and discussed work in quite a few countries, and everywhere I hear very similar responses. So why is this happening and how it is happening? This is one to talk to you about today. So there is no doubt that this is one of the outcomes as well as a way of resisting globalization. Globalization, I don't want to get now into the either theoretical or historical discussion about globalization, which is a very complex and contested uh, notion. But in very um, simple terms, it is a compression of space and time, which has been facilitated by the microchip revolution and other technological uh, innovations. And what has been happening in the last 30 years, that the kind of globalization has been constructed by new, uh, new liberal uh, political economy. Now, it is a paradox that globalization started, people talked about the fact that borders, it's going to be a borderless world, that borders are going to wane and disappear gradually. And what we see today is virtually the opposite, that all the time we see new borders and new walls and new blockages are being erected. I talked about the technological uh, innovations that facilitated um, globalization, but one of the paradoxes is that if we look at the United States, if we look uh, all over the world, Israel, uh, Hungary, 60 countries have been in recent years building physical walls like the Chinese empire did hundreds of years ago before all the surveillance technology for the securitization of borders and, and, and state have been invented. And on the other hand, when we interviewed people for this research, we found people that have walked all the way to Britain from Afghanistan, except for crossing the, uh, the channel at the back of a lorry, they have walked the whole distance. So the technology is in the sky, although not always working, as we can see today, that I, you, can, I, you can only hear me and not see me. But at the same time, both trying to uh, get, get around the blockages and the borders and boundaries on the one hand, and trying to block these people who are trying to get around is getting back to the most primitive, pre-industrialist kind of uh, uh, notions of walking and building uh, walls. Now, what people have to understand is borders do not divide the world. Borders constitute the world. The world is not a given in which each country is a given in which mutually exclusive borders are dividing it in some kind of a primordial way. Borders have been human and political invention and in many periods of history and in many parts of the world, 
there haven't been continuous borders around countries most of their history and in some of them like for example the border between afghanistan and pakistan it doesn't exist even today at the same time what we see is that the naturalization of borders is something that maybe in the mythology and knowledge of the so-called nation states exist and people talk about um, the sea and the mountain and the river like britain is an island but of course it is not an, a, an island but this is a, a different kind of discussion but what we see if we go, look for example at maps of africa or, or latin america or other places very often the borders between different states have been outcome not even of the the, the, the political projects of those who live in these countries, but outcome of colonialism, imperialism, and negotiation among them with nothing to do with the people who actually lived in this country. So this is why there are so many contestations around borders. This is why when we talk about borders and bordering, we see it not as a geographical phenomena, not even as a uh, political state phenomena on its own, but it's in between the political and the socio-cultural. So in, the, in our work, we theorize um, the, the work of, um, the, of bordering as a, a, the, entangled pol contested political project of governance and of belonging and um, i think that um, this is something that um, uh, we can uh, talk about it uh, more if uh, we will have time but i want to um, to cover quite a lot of uh, uh, of, of issues here so that we can um, have time for discussion to go back to globalization and to everyday bordering, in recent years, definitely since 2008, but um, I would uh, claim beforehand, there have been what some of us have been calling the double crisis of governability and governmentality. Because what has been happening is that power has been shifted gradually, first of all, from government to supra and non um, organizations like the multinationals, but also um, supranational organizations. And what we see there is that we are having a situation also that within the government, there is a shift and of power and struggle of power between the parliament and the government with the privatization of the um, welfare state, which is also part of neoliberal uh, globalization. We, and we see now in Brexit in Britain a very good example, pathetically, paradoxically good example of the struggle for power between the uh, parliament and uh, the government because the executive in this kind of situation cannot and does not represent the interest of the citizens but find itself negotiating between the state and the multinational and the supranational organizations and this is uh, the crisis of governability that brings with it a crisis of government governmentality because people who first were told in the neoliberal governmentality that Foucault is talking about to think that it's all, everything is their responsibility and their health and their economic situation and their familia and and and, and well-being is all their responsibility 
start to understand that there are other factors in society which are responsible to what is actually is happening. So they become very alienated from the government, like what um, Farage has, be, has been talking about, the political class and the rest of the people, as if he has not been of the political class for, um, for tens of years. So we, what we see is that there is alienation from uh, democrat growing alienation from democratic institutions and we see polarization among the population it's not just in britain it's not just in europe it's all over the uh, the world peter Geshev, for example talk about the rise of autochtonic movement in africa autochtonic means that the differentiation between those of us who belong and those of us who do not belong. It's an emptier concept even than that of ethnicity because it doesn't have history. It can work in a variety of ways. And um, we see the rise of extreme right movement, both secular and religious, who are trying to replace the uh, the the state with um, with identity politics, which are very dangerous because they exclude all those who do not belong. Donald Trump in his his, his speech uh, said, "We are the enemies of the global uh, globalism. We are for patriotism." And Marie Le Pen in France and many others have been talking in very similar uh, way. And of course, we can explain also Brexit in this way. So this, the rise of autochthonic movement is the reaction from bottom to the top. Although, of course, it also affects the mainstream discourse also that comes from um, the center and from government top down. Everyday bordering is the reaction of uh, top down when governments are trying to show to the citizens that they are keeping everyone safe. And this is why the whole securitization of borders and, and surveillance, and this is why there is this kind of decentralization and spreading of the roles of border guarding to everyone everywhere all the time so on the one hand we see i talked about deterritorialization and reterritorialization of borders so we see that borders move both out of the the margins of the and, and the territory of the state and they are everywhere in the world if somebody wants to um, visit uh, Britain from India, they go to the council there, and there they are being interviewed, and there is the border. They this, the, there they are either being blocked or not to cross the border into Britain. And um, the same thing when I wanted to go to United States when I was in Canada, the border of the United States was in Canada or in in France, it's in Calais and, and not in Britain and vice versa. So this is kind of uh, offshoring borders, but at the same time, as I said, there is everyday and everywhere bordering inside both by the, the, the professionals and, and they don't check the borders at the borders, but they raid various um, uh, employments or homes or, or, or everywhere else, but also oblige others to do the checking for them either in the formal relationship or just 
it is considered to be a good citizen in order to um, phone and let people know that they are uh, know somebody who is not legally in the country. When we did our field work, we saw a so-called surgery of formal border guards in a corner of a charity breakfast for homeless that a very known uh, charity organization was organ organizing. So don't only spread to all branches of the state through the prevent and, and other uh, legislations, but also in terms of the voluntary sector. Now, of course, there are a lot of resistance to it as well, uh, but um, at the and, and, and one good example of some of the outcome of what happens with this everyday bordering is what is known, at least those of you who are in Britain would, uh, would have heard about the wind, um, Windrush uh, scandal. I was a member of a group called Wing Women, Immigration and Nationality Group that try that campaign for people who came from ex-colonial countries of, of uh, Britain, the, especially the Caribbeans, to register as British citizens before the 1981 British nationality law came into power. Because if they wouldn't have registered then, they would be considered automatically citizens of the newly independent colonies rather than British citizens. Now, we were afraid that people who would not register, if they would leave to visit family and relatives and so on in their countries of origin and will stay for a couple of months, they will not be allowed to come back to, uh, to, the, to, to Britain. We didn't even have the right imagination to think that even without leaving the country, People who, is, who have been here since the early 60s, but have not registered, or because of some other, or lost their papers of registration, or some other bureaucratic uh, legislation, because of the technology of everyday bordering that oblige everybody to prove that they are entitled to every service of the state, like health, like education, like the right for employment, they would be considered to be irregular migrants and they will not be allowed anymore to work. They would not be entitled to get free cancer treatment and quite a few of them were actually uh, deported from the country in which they were legally in the country, but in the pre-computer time, um, it was not registered anywhere centrally except on passports that or, or, or other documents that people either mislaid or, um, or, or, or for some other reason. So this is just one of the outcomes of what is called, what Teresa May coined when she was a home secretary, coined the notion of hostile environment. And it was supposed to be a hostile environment towards those who are illegally in the country. However, what we found out through uh, everyday bordering, that it became a hostile environment to everybody. The convivial pluralism that Britain has been so famous uh, under is being threatened because it is something which does not, uh, does not encourage not only integration, but it divides even communities and families. Very often in the raids, for example, on ethnic business, the, some of these irregular uh, workers that could be uh, found um, would actually be 
um, family relatives. And we know before the referendum of Brexit, there have been bitter arguments within migrant communities, very often along the line between those who are already settled and entered the document and those who, uh, who have not. Now, the situation, however, is more complex than that. And this is why we, we kind of uh, used the methodology of situated intersectionality. Now, there are many versions of intersectionality. So this is why I call my version and the one that I use together with Georgie Wims and, and Catherine Cassidy in our work on everyday bordering. And it was part of a EU borderscape, much larger uh, project with 22 countries and so on. And I led the, the work package on everyday borders. So we all used um, this situated intersectionality methodology. And what it is, is a combination of what Leslie McCall um, differentiated between intercategorical and intracategorical um, research. Intercategorical is when you compare the same uh, variables or the same issues in different um, times and, and, and spaces, like the construction of gender in Britain and Zimbabwe today, or Britain today and Britain 50 years ago. Intracategorical is when you are trying to explore the meaning of the category. What does gender mean at the same time and at the same place? And we, we kind of recommended a combination of the two because if you just uh, do uh, the intracategorical in one place, you become very ethnocentric. You think that these meanings are beyond the time and place that you are talking about. And if you don't explore the way that gender, for example, or race or whatever, have different meaning to different situated gazes within the same place and time, uh, it's, it's again going to be homogenizing and reifying uh, different um, groups. So um, I want to give you some kind of uh, example. Uh, we did in, in Europe, but in Britain, we, uh, I want to give you a, a, a few examples and then I'll show you also excerpts from the film that we uh, made that, by the way, you can download freely when you Google um, Everyday Borders Vimeo, uh, you, you'll be able to, to download it. It's 50 minutes um, film and we did it together with um, several activist organizations and used it all to um, various uh, lecture tours and debates on everyday bowling in different parts of the country. Now, let's, I, I, I want, for example, to compare uh, border guards with uh, em employers, with employees, uh, and, and so on. We interviewed border guards. First of all, they are not homogeneous either. For example, we interviewed women who were border guards. And I don't know how many of you know about the go home vans. Um, Anna Jones from Warwick did a, a very good uh, study uh, about, about it. As part of the hostile environment, there have been vans uh, uh, in the streets of especially highly diverse um, neighborhoods, which had very big notices said, go home. If you are not legal here, we don't want you, go home. Of course, the only thing that this achieved was mass 
demonstrations against it and these vans were withdrawn from the streets after a few weeks. The women border guards that we interviewed made fun of, of this girl van and they said, oh, this is just macho gesture, uh, uh, gesturism. We don't need vans. What we need, and they showed us, were small visiting cards. So we asked, what, what do you mean? And they said, well, like we go in, in these streets that the Gohan van circulated, didn't do anything. We go in the street, we visit each business. And we tell the people there that we are, want to have good community relations and to explain them the legislation and how to do it and so on. But at the same time that we do that, from the side of our eyes, we see whether when we come, people get frightened, try to escape, and at places where we uh, saw such reaction, when we come back to the office, we tell our colleagues and then they raid the place. So you don't need big gesture, you just need the same. So this is some kind of agenda differentiation. One very important differentiation between the border guards and other members of society has been that the border guards, like everybody else that we ever talked to, of course insisted that they are not racist. Moreover, they even enjoyed living in multicultural London. However, they said the law is a law. Either you are legally here or you are not legally here. As you'll see from the excerpt that I'm going to, to show you from the film, uh, uh, at least some of, of, of this. First of all, when you look at the law, there is proliferation of borders. Although neoliberalism is supposedly about borderless, there have been different kinds of visa, different kind of borders, differentiation between the frequent flyers who, for whom um, borders are hardly visible at all to those that we have a whole section in the book about them who live in limbo spaces, in gray zones that have come to embody the, the borders because they are never allowed to cross the borders. And then in between the different kinds of visas for seasonal workers, for uh, professional workers, for students, for, for, for uh, child carers, etc., etc. Now, what, um, one of the things is that there are a list of professions of, of vocations which are very important to the, the economy of the country, and therefore people who have this um, um, profession are allowed to um, immigrate. One of these is being a chef. However, chefs from racialized minorities and kitchens like Bangladeshi, Indian, uh, Pakistani, etc., are considered to be fast food and therefore they are not proper chefs. And therefore, the Chinese, there are less and less um, professional chefs that can come from abroad who are, actually have the skills for the, all the restaurants that require them, while the second generation who grow up don't want to be in the restaurant business. Very often they they go to IT or to any other um, other kind of, of jobs. So we see that the law is not just the law. The law is discriminatory in many cases. Also, if for suspicions of illegal migrants or suspicion that you are not entitled to health care, you deprive people from their basic human rights, then what is 
legal about it, although the law is not being uh, broken uh, here. Um, I had a very moving uh, story of a student who um, who came to study NMA. In the middle of her studies, she was diagnosed with cancer. She started to have treatment, and then the MA course finished, so her visa lapsed. So she wasn't in a health, a good enough health in order to be able to go back to her country. But um, she wasn't anymore entitled to free health care. So any more radiations or, or other kind of cancer treatment, she had to pay a fortune. But because she didn't have a, the right kind of visa, she was also not allowed to work. So she was not able to earn the money in order to be able to work. So we see this kind of another paradox, like the Windrush, that, that it is a paradox on top of paradox in which supposedly the law is creating a complete impossible everyday bordering uh, situation. Um, I can go on, but I'm not sure how, how long because I want also to show this um, this fragment from the film and then to have discussion. Rashmi, can you tell me how long do I have? Uh, Hello? Hi, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear us? Sorry, can you repeat it? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, maybe uh, another five minutes and then we can, or we can see the film and you can, you can have another five minutes. Okay. I just I just want before I um I, I show the film, which in a way it's a good place to show the film now, but I just realized that I did not talk hardly at all about the gray zones and the the uh, the people who um who are in a permanent temporary situation and they either before they cross the borders or if they manage to cross the borders it also continue afterwards because even when you manage to cross the country uh, to cross the borders um, it is almost it's very very difficult to get a legal permission in order to stay even more difficult to have a permission to uh, to work. Even more difficult um, when you get a exceptional um, leave to uh, remain. Very often you have to um, to um, before before you get it, you can be dispersed anywhere in the country. And even when you get a status of um, even of a, of a refugee, which is regulated um, internationally, it has become from a permanent um, status as it used to be after Second World War. Very often, it become more and more uh, temporary, just limited for a few years, or until uh, the situation in the your your country of origin become so called safe so people were you know deported to iraq to afghanistan and very often also unaccompanied minors this is a heartbreaking situation but of course the most heartbreaking situation is the thousands and thousands that have been dying either by drowning in the sea or in the desert, either in Africa or uh, in uh, Latin America. So we have the whole kind of range from the frequent flyers for which uh, borders mean nothing to those which Agamben after Aaron called bare life that have 
no rights uh, and therefore their lives were valueless and kind of allowed to be disposed of or, or sacrificed. Uh, of course, we have been uh, also working with people uh, in the jungle of, uh, in, in Calais and both there and after those of them who managed to cross country and from other many other countries. One should never see these people as just objects. They have their own agency, they have their own organizing, they have, they have their own kind of mode of resistance and strategies of coping and survival, very admirable in many, in many ways. But uh, what is important, um, as uh, Anna Arendt and, and, and Nagam uh, commented, is that human rights are supposed to be active where citizenship rights, civil rights, have, uh, do, not, uh, do not apply. But in reality, what is actually happening is that when um, there is no citizenship rights, also there are less and less, if at all, human rights. Um, the United Nations have realized that unlike refugees that after the Second World War be, uh, got some kind of an international uh, legislation, precarious and partial as it as it is, most migrants, both internally displaced, but also those who move to work from one uh, country to another, have no international law protection. And we know that international law very often is lacking any teeth, but even this um, limited amount um, does not exist. So in uh, the last couple of years, there have been uh, develop a, a UN uh, global pact on immigration that is now very much contested in many uh, countries. And um, those of you who are in London in the 13th of June, we are organizing in um, UCL a special meeting to discuss the meaning and implications of this global pact of migration. Okay, let's now see the two uh, excerpts from the film. I, one of them would show you a situated gaze of a, a Bangladeshi restaurant owner, and the other one, uh, women, and the group of women that South of Black Sisters have been um, discussing with them. So you have both in terms of employers and employees, uh, and also in terms of tenants and and and, and uh, irregular uh, migrant um, women. Um, the thing I did not say about the situated intersectionality that its epistemology is dialogical. We don't believe that um, the truth is just one or the other, no, we are relativists in the sense that everyone has their own truth. Like Patricia Hill Collins, we believe that we can approach the truth the more situated, different situated cases are being encompassed in order to understand what the same thing means to people who are differentially situated. Okay, let's watch now the fragment. Yeah. We always say we are a victim of our own success because we have so many restaurants we expanded, but the skill staff not developed. There are reasons because government doesn't allow us to bring the skilled worker from overseas and this industry is collapsing. Restaurant owners. You know, the responsibility was imposed by the government policies that they should, every time they recruit new the employee to the restaurant, they have to check their status, especially the immigration status. Yeah. But as a restaurant owner, we are not an immigration officer. How do we know 
how to check and everything. We try our best to maintain our file and everything and this is the extra burden and we get regularly victim. They come, raid and uh, then they say 20,000 fine, 10,000 pound fine because he got an, uh, uh, the person is working, he's not supposed to work, your record checking was not properly correct so you have to pay fine and raid is a killer because what they do these days, they raid when restaurant is running. Our restaurant is busy Friday and Saturday and those people actually come to raid your restaurant in a bad manner Friday night when it's busiest time in the whole week. And what they do, they come to the restaurant, lock the door and they treat everybody like a criminal. Suppose you are a restaurant owner and you built a reputation for years and years. So that way, your 30 years of work, so 20 years of work down the drain. So when 20,000 or 40,000, if there is a two people imposed to the any restaurant, small business, this is another pressure of closing the restaurant. And I find a lot of them are cannot pay, so they sell it and goes away. This is not solving the immigration issue. This is damaging businesses. And I don't see why they're doing it. Those women I've seen with an immigration issue are often contemplated or attempted suicide. Not only do they have nightmares of the violence and abuse that they've been subjected to, but then now, in addition, having fears and nightmares about being raided and picked up. They raid in the morning, six o'clock, and uh, in the morning it was so scary. My son started crying when they came. And he was so scared. He was thinking, what going to happen next? Yes. What happened to my mom? What going to happen to my mom? So what going to happen to my dad? He, they're so scared. It's, it's like you are always afraid that maybe one day you'll be thrown out on the street. Some landlords use it mm. to intimidate you into sexual activities. The, the situation is degrading you as a human being. Because if you're in this particular situation where you can't even afford to buy your medication, you can't pay for your house rent, you are forced. If you, are, if you don't have strong will, you are forced to do anything in order to get it. I, I am an example. There has been a situation where the landlord was telling me that it would be much better for me to accept his sexual advances in order to stay in the house. It's true. It's one of the things that made me to leave that place, but you leave it to a worst a situation. When you go out on street, station or bus, immigration people, they are checking your status. When you go to NHS, you have to show your passport. So I feel so suffocated all the time. Do I deserve this kind of life? I suffered my childhood. My brother was controlling my life. After that, my husband and his family, they were controlling my life. And now, certain of the point in this country, I am, the immigration is controlling my life. So, every time, I feel like, where can I get free? I'm telling my counseling all the time. I want to breathe. I want to, I'm just watching out of the window. I'm not allowed to work. I'm not allowed to do anything. I'm just sitting home and no money, no money for medication and every time I'm thinking it's better to die rather than living this kind of horrible life. So on the one hand the state is saying please come forward and report domestic violence and rape but on the other hand what they're not doing is protecting the most vulnerable in society and those are those women who don't have a status often in the country or they're imprisoned 
in their homes and can't get out because there's a control over the family and the parents over somebody's status. Okay, so um, thank you, Neera, for that wonderful, wonderful lecture and the film. I can't wait to see the, the full film. Um, and I'm sure you have lots more to say. I'm looking forward to the book. Uh, but perhaps now is the time to open it up for questions, comments that may allow you to say more about. Yes, if I, if I can. If I can just invite everybody, I think I sent you Shashmi, the leaflet. Um, if we can, um, uh, if you are in London on the 22nd, we are having a whole other day about the book. So in Soas at Khalili Lecture Theatre. Yes, I did announce it at the very beginning, and we also sent the notice. Um, yeah, so we can, uh, you know, open this up for discussion, for your thoughts, for any comments that any of you want to make, or if someone has sent in uh, a question. Um, what I found, maybe I can start off um, with a reflection that I think. What is so powerful about this work that you've done is, uh, you know, the idea that borders are everywhere, right? Which sort of overturns the traditional sense in which we think thought of borders as bordering nation states, and we thought of immigration as something that controls movement between nation states. But I think what your research and you know your work shows is. Uh, on two levels. One is the actual internalization at the individual level, where we've all become bodyguards. You gave your example, but uh, I just came out of a meeting uh, about monitoring points for tier four students. Right. So as teachers, as academics, um, I'm not only teaching and doing research, but I have to fill out forms. You know, um, and so there's this kind of individualized, uh, you know, monitoring of, of borders, of, of keeping borders. But also borders are proliferated, they're everywhere. They're not just between nation states, but within cities, within communities, and so on. And I think that that's really powerful and important uh, because it, it really challenges how. We have thought of borders um, all this while. I also found very interesting your example of having interviewed the women bodyguards. Um, and then, of course, in the film clip that we saw, uh, accounts of women working with South Hall Black Sisters, which is a refuge but also an activist organization. And of course, today is a double feminist descent uh, day because after this at five o'clock we have a film screening and we're celebrating 40 years of South Hall Black Sisters. So I was wondering Neera if you could say a bit more about the gendering of borders um, both sort of maybe saying a bit more about among the people you interviewed women's attitudes to to keeping guards, to, to being sort of bodyguards, but also a bit more about how women are affected by everyday bordering. If you have a few more examples to give for some okay. further Okay. First of all, before I, I go to the, I come to the um, to the gender uh, uh, question or even to the individualization of um, I think you can see how everyday bordering is a very good example of why uh, national methodologies which look at society 
only with the boundaries of the state borders is really not a valid uh, unit of analysis anymore on its own. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is that it's very interdisciplinary because bordering is between the political and the sociocultural. So you cannot just talk about race study or migration study or political um, study or, uh, or social policy or gender studies um, or or, or class because everyday bordering really encompass all this field of uh, study and you cannot really understand any of them today without incorporating this um, lens of um, everyday bordering in, in this way. In terms of the universities, in, in my university, I don't, probably in Boric it's different, but I've seen in several universities, because the university management knew that the staff will be very resistant to all these kind of filling forms and all this kind of thing, they established at the entry of each classroom a place where people, uh, students, um, kind of like oyster cards that you can just kind of uh, put the card and it's electronically monitoring if people were attending or not. And that goes directly to somebody in the university administrator that has become the border guard of the university, which mediates between the home office and the body of students. And of course, universities can't afford not to uh, comply with this um, because like, uh, London Metropolitan University almost was closed down a few years ago because the Home Office claimed that they didn't monitor enough the attendance of students. So it is scandalous. And and it's and and as I said, it's everybody. Like when the Institute of Education merged together with a uh, UCL, all the members of staff, from the vice chancellor to the cleaners have to show that they have a legal right to live, uh, to, to work in, in Britain, although they've been working in the Institute of Education all this time in order to legally comply. So, so, so this just shows you what a lunatic kind of, um, uh, what we call them bordering scapes uh, all over the country, which makes no rhyme and reason except to establish hostile environment to everybody and to break social solidarity and, and social cohesion. The opposite of the supposed aim of, of this um, policy. In terms of gender, the whole issue of um, crossing a border and everyday bothering, of course, is very gendered. First of all, there are many countries in which for young men to cross the borders have become test of manhood as well as a strategy for survival for its family if they will manage to cross the borders and then send remittance, both individuals, families, communities, and uh, com countries like the Philippines and so on, which are so dependent on the remittances that migrants send uh, back home. Of course, mentioning the Philippines, this is one of the countries in which um, domestic and care professions are the major export of uh, migrants. And therefore, um, this is very different than other countries um, like China, for example, the migrants usually are the men who just finished national construction in the army and are being sent to building constructions and, and things like that in other countries. In other words, again, it, talk about the population of borders, the international labor uh, market is very, very compartmentalized and, um, and specific. So although globalization means 
that companies can produce their uh, the manufacturing and so on have, can move anywhere where there is enough uh, uh, minerals or the right taxation regime or the right infrastructure because all this uh, demagogical thing that the free market and, uh, is, 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 is free and independent uh, and, and, and global is of course nonsense because there are parasites on infrastructure and legislations of particular states. And of course, the whole way in which the power, but some states and some multinationals and all the offshoring and, and, and so on, this is um, the political economy of all this is another major area. I don't I cannot go uh, into it. But when we look like a place in like the jungle in Calais, most of the migrants were men, but there were also families there. Uh, and there were also single women and children. Um, women uh, had the options to live in a specific women's compound, which was more protected from sexual violence and so from other parts in the jungle. Uh, but and, and many chose this, but others chose to continue to live with their husbands and um, as um, as families. But of course, whether or not there were families or, or even just women very much affected the way that people could cross um, the borders. Very often, all this irregular uh, border crossing was controlled by competing and contesting gangs who had different prices to different um, venues of uh, crossing the borders from very dangerous ones of uh, jumping from a bridge on top of a of a lorry on top of the train to um, to hiring uh, motorboats and and going to um, deserted kind of beaches. Uh, so, of course. Um, those who cross the borders are not the poorest segments, nor the weakest segments of those um, who cross the borders, because the, the weakest ones very much remained in um, displaced um, camps uh, on the other side of the of, of the sea or the borders did not even make it into the heart of um, Europe and, and many of them are kind of bordered. But also in the clip, those who make it and in the clip that we saw from Southern Black Sisters, we see how sexual violence is used as a mode of control by, um, you know, some landlords are prepared to to, to have irregular migrants very often because they they offer them a substandard um, condition to live, but also of course for women they, and, and, and I'm sure sometimes also for, for young men, there are also the whole issue of, of uh, sexual uh, exploitation. So obviously like in any other sphere of society, but very often, with, more, with potentially more brutal outcome, gendering exists all the time. And another um, branch in which uh, the whole gen uh, there is the whole kind of healthcare. Um, one of the very few campaigns that had limited success have been against the demand of the Home Office for whole hospitals and other health services to supply them the data of all those that they take to care of. So even in emergency situation, people would avoid coming in order not to, um, to have the data uh, supplied and, uh, to the home office. So this was a concession, there was a suspension of this duty. But what we found out that for most women, 
and this is especially outrageous in relation to pregnant women, this doesn't make a lot of difference because they were required to pay fees that they could not afford. So the political economy of this, again, I'm coming back to. So while in other European countries, pregnant women of a regular migrant or anybody get free treatment in hospitals, in Britain, even pregnant women, uh, if they uh, have regular, irregular um, uh, migration status, are not uh, allowed to get free treatment. How many lives all this is costing, which are kind of hidden under the, the surface, let alone health. And, and the reason of this suspension was because many health professionals said, pointed out the um, risk of epidemics because illnesses don't recognize borders between the regular and the irregular uh, migrants. So it's spread in, in, in society. So these are all very tragic, very profound gendered effect of the whole everyday bordering phenomenon. Okay. Thank you. We have a question from uh, one of the participants online. Um, you don't, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear, yes. So this participant has said, this is an excellent lecture, thank you. Um, it is, uh, is it also the case that the everyday bordering extends to internalizing the internalizing of borders by those who are in insecure or temporary status positions? Sorry, I didn't hear the end. By going to what? So, uh, is it also the case that the everyday bordering extends? Sorry, I lost, I lost, I lost the sound. I hear if it's only the case that everyday bordering, and then I don't hear. Is it internalized by those who themselves have a threatened situation? Is that the question? Yeah. Insecure. Who put themselves who are insecure? Do they also internalize? The logic of borders and everything. Of borders. course, of course, this is this is of course the governmentality. I mean, but um, I think like in like the crisis of governmentality generally, people are both internalize it but also resist it. When I started to work with migrant communities, not in this research, a previous one in which. We use participatory theater in order to work with different groups of um, refugees from different countries, from uh, original uh, different countries in, in Eastern London. Um, the most privileged relatively among all of these groups were the, um, the one from Kosovo because they came first and they were allies of the Europe, so they, they, they got the formal refugee status. And yet, or exceptional leave to remain. The first day, this was a, generally a youth group. We met them in, in a school and their parents were there as well at the first time. So I, I started to chat with one of the mothers and she turned to me at a certain point and she said, you know, I'm so afraid of Thursday. I said, Thursdays, why are you afraid of Thursdays? Apparently Thursdays were the day in which with no syst apparent system or rhyme or reason, some Kosovan families would receive letters telling them that the situation now in Kosovo is secure and therefore they have to go back there. Doesn't matter that they started families, doesn't matter that children were in school or themselves or employment. So in a way, I always kind of say that the first right that the, 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 the precarious situation of migrants deprive of is the right to plan a future. You cannot rely on anything. You are always precarious. Somebody have always the authority to tell you, even if you have a formal refugee status, even recently as we have had, as uh, those who were born here and have citizenship uh, status, if you have more than one citizenship or, or a potential to have, if the state doesn't like you, 
then you lose the status. So everything becomes precarious. Everything, I mean, generally we live in the risk society, as Beck told us and so on, but towards all the migrants, the precarity of the situation, even when they manage to stabilize it legally, never leaves them. And this is something which constructs their subjectivities and affect them very much so. And also, of course, in many other ways. I've been living in this country from the early 70s. And in London, I always felt very much part of the society and everything. As a result of Brexit, I've been in situations like in very respectable contexts like the Royal Geographic Society and so on, there were round tables. And people started to come to, to discussion, have, having migrants with us have been good for us or not? Of course, at that moment, I was not part of the us. I've been excluded. I've become an object of not belonging. Since Brexit, so many of my friends have come from Europe, let alone from other places. Citizenship status have become a major prescriber of identity in a way it has never been before. So it both became one of the major axes of inequality and power relations in society, as well as one of the major constructions of our identity and belonging. And this is a very good example how governability and governmentality are both in crisis as a result of the, the present situation. Yes, we have a question here. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm wondering how you could apply inter and intra categorical research to investigating its status, whether it's citizenship or being a refugee. Well, yeah, well, this is exactly um, to stay with the situation that I was just kind of describing. So the intra categorical would be how um, being a citizen means different things to me and to people who were born here or different uh, gender, ethnicity, age group, sexuality, uh, class position, education, etc. The, the inter has, is to compare the same kind of thing with how people from, diff, from all these different positioning think about citizenship in a, daf, in a daf, different place, either another European country or a different state or even kind of in, in, in Warwick. So, so, um, so w when we did, for example, um, we did a special, one of the publications relating to this research has been a special issue of ethnic and racial studies in which we looked at everyday bordering and uh, Roma people. And one of the articles we analyzed uh, discourses on Roma in four different European countries. So this was the inter, but also we took different periods of time to see if there have been any kind of changes. So this is also inter. And then from uh, newspapers within the same newspaper and newspapers from different political um, persuasions. So this was a combination of intra and inter, which was multi-temporal, multi-spatial, as well as uh, multi-situated uh, subjectivities. Does it, uh, does it clarify? OK. Yeah. Uh, I see two more hands here. Roxanne, are there questions there? Or should we? Okay, let's. Uh, yeah, why don't you ask? Um, hi, Nira. Thank you so much. Um, in the context of everyday bordering, I'm just wondering what makes some life more precarious than others. You're wondering what? Could you please elaborate on um, why you think some life are more precarious than others in the context of everyday bordering? Why do you think some lives are more precarious than others in the 
some lights and more precarious. Well, um, first of all, there is this uh, statistical data of the thousands who have been drowning in the Mediterranean, when that mass graves under earth in uh, the desert between Mexico and the United States, and uh, in Libya, and in other uh, in the Sahara Desert, and uh, and so on. So this is kind of effect. Why? Why? Um, more people in some places are pushed more towards migration than others. So one can think that this is very kind of disparate reasons, uh, conflict and war, economic crisis, pollution, climate change, etc. etc. Uh, et but on the other hand, I, if you explore a bit deeper, you can see that much of it is very much connected to the effect of, um, of, of neoliberal globalization and before, for example, one of the problems about uh, neoliberal globalization is that um, this kind of notion that originally was a just accepted by a very small majority in, in a court in the United States, which the LTD, which gave companies a uh, person-like responsibility rather than the individuals that run the company. So if companies create terrible damage because of their kind of managers, ecological and so on, they can just, to move their operation to another country and the people involved are not responsible. There have been terrible ecological um, e e ecological uh, disasters and, and human disasters and even the banking crisis, nobody have been kind of punished for that. So, so some people are very protected while other people are very, very vulnerable to the outcomes of it, especially in states which are overall have been uh, dependent on. Uh, uh, I mean, we talk about the privatization of the welfare state, but the beginning of uh, the privatization of of welfare state started not in the global north. It started in a in the global south under the so-called structural adjustment policies that became uh, conditions for international aid uh, and, and, and development to take place, which may basically meant opening all the public sector and, 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 and the economies of the post-colonial states in, in, the, in, the, in the south to be grabbed by by a private a company and a lot of damage has been caused as a result. Although, of course, there have been uh, sectors of the population, the new middle class and so on, which have joined the, the global elite. That's, that's true, although very often they still remain racialized. So, um, so this is just very flippant. I mean, and the whole kind of substance of arms versus oil and all this kind of thing have created huge arm um, um, places in the in many I mean, uh, countries in the global south so what Marie Caldor called the new war never have, never end and it's a whole kind of way of life and governance and, and, and political economy so life there is very very precarious so this is just of the co uh, have just some reasons why yeah i think we have time only for another one or two questions yes because then uh, Lila has to leave so yeah then you ask your question uh, hello Lila. thank you very much can you hear me yes Perfect. Uh, I have a quick question. Well, you link uh, everyday belonging with sovereign mentality. And I was wondering uh, if 
you think uh, a very long term is still applicable or is it, is it still useful for uh, different contexts and by which I mean, uh, uh, for example, different time periods such as before First World War, but, uh, when governmentality was not uh, as neoliberal as today's society. Or uh, I'm, I'm sorry, your voice is breaking. I hear only about second second word. You, are you talking about everyday bordering or everyday belonging? What did you say? Everyday belonging. Yeah, uh, obviously bordering is other side of belonging because borders and boundaries decide who belongs and who does not. I talked about the autochthonic nativist um, um, political movement of the extreme right, which uh, divide the world to those who belong and those who not. And what we see is in more and more um, state, there is a movement towards what some of my Israeli colleagues called ethnocracies, that the state would be controlled by one ethnic and a national group. And of course, in every uh, state in the world, uh, to a lesser or greater uh, sense, there is more than one ethnic group and and more than people who belong to the majority national group. And um, what Michael Mann called the dark side of democracy is that very often in, especially at precarious times, there is a push for exclusionary politics that only those who belong can have access to the public resources. Marie Le Pen in France, who is extreme right, presents herself as defenders of defender of the welfare state, but of course only to those who belong. So belonging and bordering is very much a different side of the same the same thing. Because what is important are the boundaries more than what actually the criteria that dif differentiate between those that belong and those who do not belong. It can be religion, it can be accent, it can be the color of the skin. And I've seen an anti-Semitic um, uh, poster of the 30s claiming that you can identify a Jew according to the form of their elbows. So you can always pick up some kind of arbitrary um, sign in order to differentiate between those who belong and that is not and um and therefore this is something that um is 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 at the heart of contemporary political projects of belonging but they are contesting what we see is that very often um state contemporary state governance definitely britain and the eu are very much um have a, a the political project is universally so all those who have a particular le legal status are entitled to have access to the public resources and then we have all the different political projects of belonging that define who belong and who do not either according to the law or according to some other crit uh, criteria of origin color religion culture etc et so they are very often intention but they're also constructing and shaping each other and this is why we have brexit and this is why we have everything else yeah okay the last question any last question yes okay here's the last question uh, first of all thank you very much for this amazing talk uh, I have one question about the uh, discourse of racism that the early bordering actually creates or motivates. In Turkey now, uh, there are more than 3 million Syrian refugees, and yeah. one of the arguments that is used against them is that uh, these workers are creating cheap labor, cheaper labor, and thus contributing to the unemployment. And I was wondering. Whether your research also you know, includes such a uh, relationship with the unemployment and the discourse of racism that the everyday bordering creates. 
absolutely. I mean, Syrian refugees, by the way, this is very interesting because Syrian refugees in the last few years were the only one that legally had any kind of chance to get a, a legal status uh, in bulk. So, for example, projects, fellowships for refugees, like in Bay University, I don't know if in Warwick it was the same, were confined only to Syrian refugees, not to refugees of any other uh, nationality. So we have this, this kind of inequality. But of course, the accusation that um, not necessarily regular migrants, but all migrant labor, um, this is what the argument against free movement from Europe and all the East European workers and so on, uh, lower the um, uh, the uh, salaries and and uh, and so on. Um, I think there have been a lot of empirical um, research, um, and and I've I've had people from the Labour Party speaking about it that prove that this is actually not true. If you keep to the legal frame of employment because you have minimum wage and you have all these kind of conditions that uh, allow people to work on equal condition uh, safety condition as well as uh, equal um, equal wages what we do see however is that a lot of the neoliberal economy depends on the fact that there are irregular migrants, illegal migrants, that they can exploit and employ under the minimum wage. What would the restaurant kind of, uh, or entertainment uh, and, and so on, and, and some other uh, former, uh, some other branches of the economy would do if they cannot employ in this uh, um, underhand way uh, people who, because of lack of legal status, cannot resist their condition of uh, exploitation. So I don't think it's a question of uh, migrants lowering the, uh, the, the wages of people, but this is why the trade union movement have been moving between this kind of racism against migrants to the movement we have to unionize the migrant workers and they will just have the same conditions as us. This is why a yeah, trade union like UNITE, I, I recently attended an excellent, um, uh, it's called the PPT, the Permanent People's Tribunal on the hostile environment and situation of migrants in, in, in this country. And it was largely sponsored by the UNITE uh, trade union because they understand that it's their interest to unionize as many of the migrants as possible. They also understand, at least as long as Britain is in the EU, uh, but this is one of the reasons they want it to continue to be in the EU, that in the same way that multinationals have bases in more than one country, unions have to have uh, bases in more than one country so that there can be some kind of equalization of conditions of uh, labor because the exploitation of, of labor is not just in the same country. I mean, talking about uh, by British and so on is, is of course very ethnocentric where it's very much rely upon exploitation of those who do not belong, who works in other uh, economies. And of course, this is something that uh, people uh, are anti-racist, um, uh, movements are, are trying to to struggle against. Anyway, thank you very much. And, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot see more of you, or you could see more of me. But I wish you all success in your fascinating webinar, and I hope that the technology will be better in the following months. Yes, thank you, Ira, for your time and for that. Very inspiring talk. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bye. thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye. Okay. Uh